After the unprecedented success of Codenames, CGE was able to focus on the quality of games and even choose to publish games that might be more risky commercially. We felt that uh, even though we know that maybe group of people who would like the game and to whom it will be might be too small to pay it off, uh, it's worth doing anyway. The After Codenames era was also marked with a new generation of game designers and fresh ideas that CGE embraced and helped bring to life. My favorite CGE game is Adrenaline, for sure. I had a chance to work on that game. I really like working with Philip Naduk as a game designer. Uh, he had a talent to actually create some light game mechanics, really light ones, uh, which you will enjoy on a first moment when you see them. And I really appreciate that. So Adrenaline was my first laugh uh, in, in Czech Games Edition. And also it was uh, uh, a first big project uh, I was able to work on. So I worked with uh, Philip Neduk uh, together, finishing uh, Adrenaline, also uh, doing uh, the first expansion. I think Adrenaline was the first point I started making games about the video games I played as a kid. So I played a lot of Quake and Unreal Tournament and uh, really wanted to see if, that's, uh, if that feeling when I played the game could be made into a board game. So that was kind of the core idea and it was like a crazy concept. How do you do a first person shooter in a board game? Uh, and uh, we kind of managed to pull it off uh, and that was kind of the, the, the starting point. I think they found that concept interesting as well. For many years, uh, he was coming to Essen, showing us his prototypes. But we always kind of were looking forward to meet uh, Philip Neduk, because he has a lot of ideas. So we kind of kept him always as a, our last meeting in Essen, uh, because it was always kind of motivating and uh, we were enjoying you know, looking at his ideas because, you know, he came with very, always with very fresh ideas, something which is not there and it always put smile on our faces and so on. And uh, yeah, he also came with this idea for a game which was basically implementation of first person shooters in board game. I had this like rough idea for Adrenaline around the time the Goblins came out and it took a while to, to get to the position where CG liked the game. So I was at one of their events, the Czech gaming event, uh, and I showed it to them there for a couple of years. I, I don't think they, they took it uh, immediately. And I kinda, there I kind of learned what's wrong with the game and it iterated a lot on it. And at some point it just kind of clicked for them, I think. Uh, and uh, there was like a mechanic I introduced, the area control mechanic that was really interested, interesting. Uh, and I think that's, and the theme and everything, it, I think it kind of clicked for them. And then and, and 2016, uh, Adrenaline came out. Mm -hmm. A lot of the playtesting and iterations happened during what you probably have heard a lot by now in this docu-series, this event called Czech Gaming. CGE does this uh, like Czech Gaming event every year. Uh, it's focused for uh, playtesting the, the game that's uh, supposed to be published that year. Uh, but it's also an opportunity to bring some new designs and test some new designs and uh, decide whether we would like to publish them. Because I'm from Croatia, I'm from a different country, uh, we usually do things online and uh, the best parts and best memories I have when they invite me to Czech Gaming so I can actually make games in person with them. Uh, and I really like that experience, yeah. yeah. 
it was it was kind of getting into the headspace of CG. <laughs> One of the best success stories of Czech gaming was that of Letter Jam. And for, for Letter Jam, it was uh, really nice how it was discovered. Because Ondra Skopi, who at the time worked at CGE and still, still is part of CGE, uh, brought this game to one of our CGE retreats. Uh, it was, was Czech Gaming, no? Yeah, Czech Gaming. He brought it there and was quite anxious to show it to other people. But we ended up playing that game all the time, actually, during Czech Gaming. And uh, after that, we decided that we would like to publish it. It was like one of those dream stories, to some extent. It was actually quite surprising because uh, I didn't even know that Ondra was working on a game and then he just brought the game kind of like Ondra is very humble and but he's so brilliant so he brought this game kind of like offering it for us to play if we want and we played it and we had a blast it was amazing uh, it, it worked and he was like oh this is this is my game and I sat there and I played it and I immediately went to Peter and I said I want this game I want this game in the US and thankfully we were able to sign it and that's, I got to do a lot of play testing with that too and a lot of promotion for it. Ondra actually works for CGE, but he also does stuff for um, Cryptomania, which is a company that specializes in making these cipher scavenge hunts, basically, uh, where you get to solve ciphers and, and, and it's like, cryptography and, and stuff like that and he's really into that and if you look at letter jam you realize that makes sense because letter jam is kind of like a, a solve a cipher kind of game right it's it's like putting together letters to make a word uh missing one letter in 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 a word that is being spelled out in front of you and, and everyone sees it a little differently everyone has a little different piece of the puzzle that you're together trying to put together um I think that Letter Jam is a really, really nice game that describes the author because, you know, knowing the author, Ondra, he is, uh, you know, Letter Jam really is his game. Like, it really makes sense that it is his game. I, I love that. The silly talk about the cover, that, because that was a really silly talk. And I'm really happy that the game performs this well. And it was like step in the unknown regarding the regarding the uh, the artwork. So in the end, that that uh, strawberry which is on the cover, um, you know, so many ideas. We learned a lot of things about fruit. Oh the game. yes, a lot of things. The art style was really, really difficult to figure out. We had to go through so many fruits oh, yes. to choose for those poker chips. And we learned some new names like Mangosteen. Mangosteen, yeah. What, what Mangosteen actually yeah. looks like. For me, it was one of the first games I've actually got to see from the beginning to an end, it was really nice to see how it developed into this really, like, especially visually, like elegant and very light style. Uh, and the best thing I like about the box is the strawberry. Oh yeah. Take a look at the strawberry. Take a really good look at the strawberry. You'll find secrets. And when you first open a new copy, the cards are arranged in a way that it also gives you a secret message. That year, CG also released another Philip Naduk game. Inspiration comes from like all different angles. You never know what's gonna like uh, hit that spark. 
So Sanct, the inspiration behind Sanctum, uh, it's kind of in the vein uh, as Adrenaline. I played uh, a lot of Diablo when I was younger and I kind of know the ins and outs. Uh, and I know that a lot of people don't like this, but I really like to like manage my inventory in Diablo and I kind of made the game around that concept. Uh, uh, it's kind of the same as Diablo, but it focuses on like uh, uh, fighting monsters, getting new items and kind of recycling the process, testing out your build on, on new monsters and so on and so on. And, and I really wanted to make it into this like compact uh, experience. So you kind of feel like you're playing Diablo, but it's also in a board game form. That game uh, took, uh, <laughs> was on a long, long path. Uh, it like changed themes, uh, changed dip different type of games. But the only thing that kind of uh, stuck with the game was like that inventory system. That's that's kind of the, the the heart of the game, and always was. Uh, and it went through a lot of iteration. I, I remember I showed it to CG just about the time Adrenaline was came, coming out. And uh, it was a completely different game then, but I think they really liked the inventory system stuff. And uh, uh, when we, we iterated a lot, a lot on that project, and I think, yeah, it finally came to what it is uh, uh, fairly late in the production. And it was a, a tough cookie to crack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When you kill some creature, uh, you know, uh, there will be loot out of it. So this is why in the game you have cards where on one side you have a creature and when you kill it you will flip it and it will show the uh, equipment it will give you and you can use this equipment uh, where it and so on and you level through there and everything and uh, I really like it personally because I'm I'm I was playing Diablo a lot, uh, especially Diablo One. The most interesting thing about the game in the end for me was how the leveling up system uh, and uncovering new uh, abilities in the game works, uh, and the fact that you know they are different for every class. It makes for me really interesting. Uh, yeah, the only thing which which is not as good as we hoped for was the final battle uh, with the final boss, which we kind of uh, knew, but we weren't able to actually find something more meaningful, more interesting. Uh, the art for Sanctum, uh, I mean, there's a like d direct inspiration for Diablo. We kind of wanted to capture that feeling. Uh, I especially liked working on the box. Uh, I think that box is like really gorgeous uh, and it's really impactful and the colors are great and it really kind of pops out. Uh, it looks like a sarcophagus that you kind of open up and play the game, uh, which is really in theme with everything. I especially like the, the board that Andre Hardina made for, for uh, Sanctum. Uh, I, uh, his, I think it's the first time he worked for CG and nobody no, knew what to expect and he was really fast at it. He made this beautiful artwork and everybody was like crazy impressed with him. Yeah, I think he worked on Arnak later on, yeah. Yeah, the, the first map was, uh, was quite a challenge, uh, but I, I loved like painting the little houses and my favorite area there is the the sea like painting the seaweed and the waves um, i just never painted anything in that perspective like isometric without perspective and then in the second map uh, i think that one reinforced my love for painting rocks and cliffs it was just very fun to you know think of like stone as just blocks that uh, start as blocks and then fall apart uh, i think also i i maybe went on a trip to uh, Česká Švýcarsko. it's a national park in 
uh, the north of the country and there's this famous stone arch, Pravchitska Brana. I think they filmed Narnia there, Narnia Chronicles. Uh, yeah, I drew from that and yeah, and then also the fourth map, there's this little element of like a bit of pink sunset light uh, showing on just the tip of the cliffs and I don't know, I just like these like little things, I see no one like mentioning them, but for me uh, they are what make the piece like pop and uh, special in my head. I, yeah. And just before the pandemic hit, as if they knew, CG decides to release their first and only solo game. That's one of my favorite games. Um, you know, sometimes you discover some games which already are somewhere, uh, like uh, Under Falling Skies, which was print and play game already. You can uh, download it from uh, Board Game Geek, in, even in these days. So you can try it and play it. But CG decides to uh, make it better and bigger. And from my point of view, that was really a good decision because the game can shine uh, right now. I attended my first Czech gaming uh, even before I started to work in the company. Uh, I was invited, I suppose, mostly as the like more involved playtester. Uh, but anyway, I was there and, and by, by then I was also working on that uh, small print and play game, The Under Falling Skies. And I just brought it with me just to maybe get some playtest out of it so I can finish it for the contest or whatever. I remember back then that uh, Vladia really liked the game and um, I think I um, like owe him a big thanks because uh, I think it was uh, also a lot because of him that we published the game because he really, really uh, liked it. Um, and for, for me, one of uh, really nice moments when, was when I woke up and uh, went to the like gaming room and I met Vladia and Vladia told me, uh, I, I mean, I, I needed to try the game once more, like one more time. And I've gone to bed at about uh, three at the, at the night because I was playing the game and it was uh, really nice. And, and was uh, the start of like deciding to publish the game. Our first and only solo game. Uh, we were kind of fortunate that at the same time COVID happened also. So it was the right uh, game for that time. But still, we never released solo game before and all our partners were, ah, we are not sure if we want this game because, you know, it's just solo and we do not know how big uh, t uh, target group for this kind of game is. So, but we did it anyway, and it turned out that uh, it was good. Um, partly because it was <laughs> at exactly the right time, but the game is really good, and I think everyone here at CG is really glad that we did it. I attended uh, one more print and play contest before uh, doing Under Falling Skies. Uh, I uh, actually also won that contest with a different game. Uh, but, what I, but what I really love about those contests that they are so tight because you have those uh, really, really big limitations like using only nine cards or whatever. And my first game, First Snow, uh, was designed as a two-player game. and. Uh, I realized that that might be even too tight for just nine cards and a few components. Uh, so for the second time, I went for a solo game because it leaves you with more resources uh, to give to each player or to, to use for the game because you have only, only the one player. And uh, that's why I decided to do a solo. Uh, but it was also a kind of a challenge for me because I, I wasn't uh, really a big solo player. And uh, so I thought, okay, so how should a solo game uh, look like so I would enjoy it? Like, I think you probably, you probably heard the exact same thing. I do not play solo games. 
but I play under falling skies. It's like, I don't know why, I don't know how it's possible, but I don't find solo games usually exciting. I, I cheat in them, right? Because I'm playing a game myself and I don't want to lose it. Who cares? I'll just change this and like, whatever. And then I'm like, I don't want to play this anyway. And then I leave the table. With Under Falling Skies, for some reason, I'm really excited about playing it myself or with someone, just rolling those dice and trying to win and trying to, you know, what you usually do in solo games, but for some reason to me, like, solo games were never appealing before Under Falling Skies. And I feel like a lot of people say the same thing. It's also fun to watch how somebody else is playing the game, which is always, for me, the kind of the, the important thing uh, to have with the game, because when the game is not interesting to me enough, uh, to look at the game while some other people are playing it, then um, it will be too daunting to actually release such game. I think one of my fondest CGE game moments was probably playing Under Falling Skies wrong for about five or six different times. Uh, we played it so many times and then we finally realized after like, I want to say like the sixth or seventh play, oh, we've been making this way hard on ourselves. Uh, so. It's still a very, very fun game for us. It's a solo game, but we love to play it co-op and it's one that stays in our collection. And there is a one thing which, which I love with Under Falling Skies, the heavy box. So if you will take that box and you can feel it's full of content in it. So that's, that's feel amazing because I'm one of the gamers who likes opening box and finding a lot of things in it. So. There's so much stuff in the box. Oh yeah, it's it's. I think it's one of our densest games, right? One of the compared like I to think the so. space. I think so. The amount of components and the free space in the box. Because we haven't realized that sure we have to ship those games all over the world, and if it's too dense, we won't be able to fill the container. Not just with Under Falling Skies games, but uh, game we need something that's like more empty inside, <laughs> otherwise it will be just half empty, the whole yep. container. So because there are of course regulations and like there's certain weight limit that we have to, we have yeah. to keep. For, for me, um, I was always so loving like designing games and playing games. And, but I never thought that I might be doing it like for a living. So uh, for me, like working in a board game industry is still kind of surreal. Like it's uh, still hard to believe that. Um, but I, what I really love about it is how creative it can be. Like uh, it's the like exact kind of things I would love to be doing anyway. Like, if it won't be board games, then I'm not sure what should it be would have the same creative aspect. Apart from financial stability and openness to new and fresh game ideas, the post-Codenames era allowed CG to move to new offices. Ulik, the designer of Unfalling Skies, being also an architect, was overseeing the process and, fun fact, that was his first real assignment when starting to work for CGE. This building was a huge project for CGE, just like board games usually are. It was like, oh, we want to have our own building now, um, with, with where we can play games, where we can work, where we're just going to be cool to hang out with. And the successful finalization of this building was, I think, an enormous milestone for the company. It was like, you know, I think every one of the employees, when we walked into this new building, we were like, that's when, that's when, that's when you understood, you know, that CGE has just, you know, we've, we've, we've upgraded to a higher level. Uh, it's of course, didn't happen like that. The building has nothing to do with the company upgrading, right? But it really felt like, because, you know, we've, we're still publishing board games the same way. Um, it just felt that way, you know, it felt like we have our own space, um, we've made it, you know, we're successful. I mean, CG was successful before that, but like, we've made it. I don't know, I don't know how to, do, how to explain it. I believe that, uh, you know, moving into this new, amazing, beautiful office 
uh, where we can play together and, and, and work together um, was one of the greatest milestones of CGE. Thank you.